now I have the great honor to introduce to you today's keynote speaker. Dr. Lloyd Reber is a professor in the Department of Educational Psychology and Instructional Technology at the University of Georgia. He is Director of Innovation and Teaching and Technology for the College of Education at UGA. He received his PhD from Pennsylvania State University and is a former classroom teacher. He is interested in visualization, cognitive psychology, and constructive I'm sorry, <laughs> constructive <synthesis. Close enough. laughs> orientations to instructional design. <laughs> Dr. Weaver's presentation is entitled Feel Feeling Like a First Year Teacher Towards Becoming a Successful Online Instructor. And now I'd like to introduce to you, please, Dr. Lloyd Reber. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm really excited about this conference. I hope I can do some justice as the keynote, uh, the opening keynote, to uh, kind of set this, maybe the tone and the stage for uh, your experience here uh, in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Um, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a full tenured professor at the University of Georgia, and uh, I've been teaching online, also face-to-face, -face, um, in that combination since about, about, about 2001. And uh, the experience of becoming an online instructor after having been a, I think, a fairly successful instructor in many ways, uh, after many, many years, really made me think about what it was like to, to be a first year teacher. And in fact, the photograph that you see up here is yours truly, circa 1979, at uh, Carmel Elementary School in uh, the Pittsburgh Public School System. I am a former public school teacher. I was a, a fifth grade teacher for, uh, for five years. And uh, I think I still own that suit. So, uh, uh, but that was an incredible time for me, that, that first year of actually being in the classroom, that, that sense of enthusiasm, that sense of excitement, and that sense of terror, frankly, that one uh, has when you are, you are in the classroom. And I revisited all of that when I first began to teach, to teach online. And that's really what I want to talk about today is that experience, because I think many of you also might be having a very similar experience. I'd like to, uh, maybe some of my stories might be helpful. I couldn't resist but to show a few other first year teachers uh, in, uh, in film history. And uh, if you look at some of these, you'll probably date yourself if you know, if you know the answer. Uh, room 222, Karen Valentine on the left hand side there. Uh, it was actually, yeah, it was a great, just a great television uh, series. Uh, although Karen Valentine was a student teacher for almost five years, so I don't know if she had uh, quite what it took to become a teacher. Uh, Conrack, one of my, uh, 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 the, the movie of, again, in, in also in, in, the, in the South, uh, and, and kind of looking at what, uh, what it was like in a, in a different cultural uh, environment for that young man, and also uh, there's some really interesting uh, messages about the use of, uh, of media in there. I was actually a fifth grade teacher uh, in New Mexico. I was, a, uh, I was trained up in Pittsburgh. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a native uh, Pittsburgher, but then went to uh, New Mexico. And again, very similar experience of being in a new cultural environment, trying to make sense out of a lot of things, including my place in the, in the community. Uh, uh, Sidney Portier in, uh, in To Serve With Love, uh, Robin Williams, uh, and of course, uh, um, uh, uh, Escalante with, uh, with, uh, with his work, and of course, welcome, welcome back, Cotter. Um, I always like to introduce myself, again, as someone who is definitely outstanding in his field. And I do own some eight acres uh, north of Georgia, north of UGA. My wife actually is a, is a dairy farmer, is a very, very nice uh, experience there. And uh, this is a boring slide. I won't be on it for more than about five seconds. These are some of the titles of my publications. But if you put it into a word cloud, those exact same words, this gives you some idea of who I am and what, what I am all about. And you see a lot of hopefully interesting uh, things that are highlighted. You know how a word cloud works. The, the more times the word is used, the bigger the word gets. So of all those titles of, of my publications, you can see that learning, obviously, is a very big part of it, but also play. 
sim simulations, games, micro worlds, animation, um, uh, learning environments. So, so I, I have, a, I think, uh, a fairly interesting background in terms of learning and education and where I came from, but then trying to leverage that into online education. When I was a brand new teacher, I had a very interesting uh, set of mentors, and one of those mentors was Ginny Hill. She was a uh, teacher in 1979, 1980, that school year, who uh, had already been teaching for 10 years, but took some time off to raise, begin to raise a, raise a family. And so she came back into the classroom at the time that I started. And uh, I still remember so vividly, as I was ready, readying for the first day of, of, of school, I was talking with Jenny, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm new. I, I just moved to New Mexico. Uh, I'm, I, they, the, the first day of school is right around the corner. We're all so busy. But I had a conversation with her where she had taken some summer, a summer faculty development experience and learned about something called the workshop method, which is really all, isn't that important for this, for this conversation. But well, what, is, what is important, she decided, based on that experience, that that was a much better approach than what she had been doing previously. And the, the lesson I learned from that was never to be afraid to say, yes, that's a better idea. Because she could have said, no, 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 I have 10 years of, of teaching experience, and I definitely know how to teach, and therefore don't go telling me anything about that. But no, she saw a better approach and revamped her entire teaching style accordingly. And that's something that, that has tried to stay with me. And I think in my field of instructional technology, this is something we're always looking, f looking to what are the new innovations and trying to make sense out of them, what's the hype versus, versus uh, what we should be taking seriously. I also am here, <laughs> I guess why I'm really so excited about being here, I'm, I'm here to talk about teaching over the next 24 hours. I'm here to talk with people and listen to people who are interested in teaching. And uh, so many times in, in, in a higher education uh, environment, again, University of Georgia in particular, when we talk about the different missions and the different, different uh, uh, goals and needs that all faculty have of teaching, research, and service, uh, sometimes the conversation about teaching isn't as valued as I wish it were. And so I'm very happy and, and humbled to be in the presence of some great teachers. This is a, a book, if you haven't read it, if you, anybody know this book, just raise your hand and give me a sense if you've come across this book before, The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. All right, I encourage you to actually uh, take a look at this book. Here's a good quote from the book. It says, if you are a teacher who never has bad days or has them but does not care, this book is not for you. This book is for teachers who have good days and bad and whose bad days bring the suffering that comes only from something one loves. So again, I think most of us in this room, because we are here, probably can resonate with this as compared to perhaps some of the individuals who don't value teaching, who think that you know, the students are lucky that they happen to be in the classroom on that particular day. Uh, this is for this conference, I think, and certainly what, what I'm all about is talking about talking to people who really do, in a sense, suffer for something that they love. And you, you take very personally when your teaching and your students' learning perhaps is not going as well as you would like it to. Any physicists in the audience? Any physicists? You probably know uh, the, uh, the Red Book, the, the, the Feynman Lectures on Physics. Um, I wouldn't say he's one of my heroes. He was actually, this is, uh, Richard Feynman was a, uh, uh, well, passed away in 1988, a, a Nobel laureate, 1965, I think. But uh, he was a really interesting character uh, uh, in, his, in his off life. But he valued teaching, so a, a physics Nobel laureate and I won't read the whole quote here, but the main message is, I don't believe I can really do without teaching. And in the, uh, in the book, uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, he talks about those poor SOBs at Princeton who had this lovely situation where they don't have to teach anything. And he felt sorry for them because day after day you can go by with no new, I new, new ideas. And what do you do when you don't have any new ideas? Well, you just go day after day. Teaching, he talked about, gave him a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. And many times, the students would ask questions that reminded him of something kind of important. They, they didn't know they were reminding him of a problem that was really difficult to solve. They were looking at it from a very 
maybe different, uh, different way. But that, that act of teaching gave him a sense of purpose and a sense that he was needed. And then the ideas would also come. Uh, again, a brilliant man. Well, let's see who's here today. Um, I, I don't know if this is going to generate uh, uh, all of the uh, different people who are here, but uh, you can see my little bulleted list of, of, of who I think might be here. So we're going to have a little competition to see who's, who's represented here by, uh, as, I, as I call out that area, like education, physical, and life sciences, and so forth. I'd like you to applaud if you're in that category, and we'll kind of see what we what we have here. So how many people here are associated with a college or school of education? All right. Physical and life sciences? All in the back, too. That's interesting. Uh, social sciences? Business? <laughs> Extra point for enthusiasm. Uh, medicine and health? <laughs> you have any problems, that's the place to go. Okay. <laughs> Journalism? Journalism? No reporters in the room. That's good. I can speak more freely. And how about law? No one from the, from the legal profession. Who, who did I miss? I'm sure I missed someone. I'm sorry. The, yeah, I missed a lot. Okay. So the arts? Who else from the arts? So engineering, the tech, engineering technology. Okay. <laughs> Who else did I miss? Library information science. Quite a few there. Okay. Any others? Any others? Mathematics. Modern language, boy, it goes on and on. So yeah, so we have a, we have a good group of individuals and, and a good diversity of interests. Um, well, let's do the same thing here. Let's, instead of looking at areas or content areas, look at kind of where your, your situation is. I think most of us are probably in higher education, but I'm not, I'm not so sure. So same, same thing. So higher education? <laughs> Looks like just about everybody. K to 12 schools, anyone? All right, good, good. Business and industry? Government? Informal education? Like museums and so forth? Any other nonprofits? Anyone I missed? Okay, and now finally, this is the last one for this. I am kind of curious what our background is with, with teaching and also, of course, online teaching given the, the nature of the conference. So, same thing, you kind of see, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in who is here um, who has some experience. But let's first start off with who here are teachers? All right, we have that in common. How about those who have not yet taught a completely online course? So some individuals really looking forward to learning more about that and hearing some good stories about good online teaching. Who here is currently teaching online? Looks like the majority. So of those, how many have been teaching online for over two years? Five years? Ten years? OK. So again, some experts over there. But yeah, quite a bit of experience and expertise, I think, in the room. So again, looking at the program, I'm not surprised. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent program. Let me start off by talking about a few issues that maybe some of you are aware of or you, you, you uh, have read some of the literature or uh, m maybe you just have some beliefs that these either go with or, or, or against. And I'm actually drawing upon a, a wonderful talk that uh, Rory uh, McGreal from uh, Athabasca University gave at a recent conference in, in, uh, in, in Athens this past summer. I got to know Rory a little bit. He gave me permission to talk with you about some of the things that he talked about, and I've used some of his slides with, with his permission. And uh, I'm just hitting some of the highlights, but I think it's kind of important to, to think about some of these issues and also to confront, perhaps, what might be some myths. And I think this is one that we uh, all confront, and that is that traditional classroom learning is better than e-learning. And the, the, the the interesting point is, if you look in the literature, there is no data to support this conjecture. 
Now, there's good teaching and there's bad teaching. <laughs> you know, there's, there's plenty of that. But to have a belief that traditional classroom learning is better than e-learning, there is no data to back that up. In fact, I'm also a, an author of another um, approach to, to learning and instruction at the University of Georgia. We call it the studio approach, very similar to the arts and also architecture, but we use it in education. And we just published a, an article about that. And it was kind of frustrating because the, the uh, reviewers wanted some evidence that uh, that approach was as good as the traditional approach. And it kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, um, Rub me the wrong way, because we never ask for evidence to suggest that the, the traditional approach is a good approach. There's, there's a de facto assumption that uh, a face-to-face -face approach is going to be superior, or a traditional content-driven approach, again, compared to the studio, studio approach that we wrote about. I think the same is true with e-learning. Uh, I know of one good meta-analysis that looked at uh, a hundred or more studies over the span of about 15 years in one of, the, one of the journals that is highly regarded in my field, the Review of Educational Research. And basically what they are finding, these are just a few of the main quotes, distance education works extremely well sometimes and extremely poorly other times. Boils back, boils back down to good teaching. The results of this meta-analysis provide general support for the claim that effective distance education depends on the provision of pedagogical excellence. Again, going down to what is good teaching. If one overarching generalization is applicable here, it is that sufficient opportunities for both student, instructor, student, student, communication are important, possibly in the service of collaborative learning experiences. And finally, one possible implication is that distance education needs to exploit media in ways that take advantage of its power. Distance education should not simply be an electronic copy of paper-based material. And a lot of these issues really resonate with me because of my background in instructional technology. We have this long history of, of research that looks at uh, the influence and the role of media in education, and also have made a lot of mistakes in comparing different delivery platforms, this media comparison, which this actual article addresses, although I would say also kind of falls into some of those traps of comparing the general format of delivery of, of, of education. And you really can't make those comparisons, is, is, the, is the argument. But again, they did a very thorough, thoughtful review, finding, for the most part, no significant differences. So I find that to be, one, not a surprise, and also somewhat encouraging that you, you would not expect, simply on the basis of a face-to-face -face versus online experience, one to be better than the other. It depends what you're doing in that environment. Uh, similarly, the, the myth that a students need a live teacher in a physical classroom and that human interaction is necessary for learning. Well, first of all, if you're in the back row of one of our large lecture halls at the University of Georgia, I would say that person sitting in the back row is also experiencing distance education. <laughs> Even though they are physically in the very same room with the instructor, and potentially having some kind of an exchange you know, from, a, from across the chasm. So uh, there's that. The, the second thing, and I, I have so many examples, and I don't have time to share many examples with you, but uh, this is one example that I, I will share with you, just to kind of give you a little inspiration about the range of resources that are out there. We live right now, in a, from an educational point of view, with access to, the, to, the, to technology and the internet, to a vast array of really exciting resources. Let me just show one to give you a little sense of what's out there. And again, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about here. And I can, I can interact with this, but uh, I'm just going to let it play a little bit. And I, let me explain what's going on. At first, it looks very, very confusing. But this is an example of. Uh, from astronomy, the idea of uh, retrograde motion. And it's also, besides being astronomy and science, it's also great history, because we have looked into the heavens for, for eons, trying to make sense out of what we see. And of course, some of the, most of the stars seem fixed. And at night, they kind of revolve around the, the North Star. But the ancients saw some stars that seemed to be wandering. Indeed, the word planet I believe is derived from the Greek for wandering star. 
And it, it, it was, what's going on? What, these stars almost have a personality. So let me, you're still, I know, going to be confused looking at this. Let me try to orient you, then it will become crystal clear. First off, you can see in the center of the screen is the sun. And you can barely see it, but on the right-hand side under view controls, you look from, in this case, the Earth, and you're looking towards, you're looking at Venus. So, you know, we're that uh, uh, planet right there. There's the Earth, a little blue marble. So you can imagine being on the Earth with a telescope. And you have that telescope trained, fixed, focused on the wandering star that we call Venus. Night after night, you're looking at that star. So that's what that, that line is supposed to represent. So the telescope looking at that wandering star. Now, the outer ring is what it looks like from your point of view on Earth. So the sun, for example, we see the sun moving around the Earth. That's what it looks like to me. But the other object that's doing a little dance, that's Venus, as it looks from your position on Earth. And so if you can kind of look back and forth between Earth that is moving and the outer ring, which is being on Earth, which is, seems to be fixed, you start to get an idea of why we have this thing called retrograde motion, where it seems to go backwards every now and then. So as you, can you can it begin, to, begin to see it now? So you have the two planets going around the sun, but at different periods, different times. And so when I get to the point where the, where the planet kind of speeds around and kind of beats the Earth, it, from the point of view on Earth, it actually looks like it's going backwards. Very difficult to derive based on the empirical evidence of standing on what you think is a fixed surface of the Earth. But when you look outside of your orientation to the fact that maybe the Earth is actually moving, you see it very differently. Well, you could play with this, and there's, the math and the physics are all there. And this, to me, is just an example of the kinds of resources that we can take advantage of. Another e-learning myth is that there is little quality control in e-learning. And uh, I think quality control is a big, big issue in, in, in all education. Uh, I very quickly come back to some of the uh, uh, groups and organizations that are working very hard on this issue. And I know uh, Columbus State also, uh, the people I've talked with so far, have been referring to the qualitymatters.org site. And this is a, 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 a very well-known organization, came out of a FIPSI grant. And you can go to the site now and get a lot of resources uh, to help understand what does it mean to have quality uh, 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 distance education. If you belong as a, as a member organization on this, with this organization, I believe you get uh, reviews and you get kind of like, you know, you're getting evaluated and, and having really some basis for saying that, yes, we have a quality, a quality program. Uh, the in other interesting thing is I, I'm, I'm a former Penn Stater, and I had the opportunity to go up to Penn State last year to visit with the Penn State World, World Campus folks. And when it comes to uh, some of the, the, the larger online courses that are part of a, a place like Penn State World Campus, the amount of time and attention that goes into to the design of those courses is absolutely awesome. And so I would say for the most part, if you take any face-to-face -face course as compared to an online course that has been through a systematic design process. Uh, in terms of quality, hands down, the online course is going to be better because of the time and attention that has gone into that. But it doesn't, come, it doesn't happen by accident. You have to invest that time uh, in instructional design and in being able to take advantage of the resources that are, that are there. A lot of instructional design with media is about taking advantage of the affordances of the resources that are there. And indeed, face-to-face -face teaching, one of the most important resources that are there is the instructor. And so a face-to-face -face experience could be a fantastic experience and be much better than an online course if you take advantage of what the instructor has to offer. But that takes time and attention. And this is maybe the one that a lot of people have the hardest time with. And that is that small class size is better for students 
than large classes. And what's most interesting, if you look at the data, what the research shows is that, yeah, one-on-one -on -one instruction is the best. Uh, a ratio of one to two, one to three, very, very good. One to 10. Up to about one to 20, you can make the argument that um, a, a, a ratio, a small class size, is uh, uh, an improvement, is a better situation. From about 20 to 30, it starts to get pretty fuzzy. And after that, it doesn't seem to matter. So this notion that you're going to have you know, diminishing returns on, um, uh, of class size, of the quality, there just isn't the research to back that up. And so, yeah, if you're in a situation where you can have a very small class size, again, and, and where I'm at, small graduate classes, doctoral seminars, and so on, obviously that would be, that would be the, the preferred way. But if you're in a face-to-face -face, uh, experience and you have well over 30 students, the, the, the um, ability to take advantage of what you might call the personal effect of the instructor diminishes off very, very quickly. And this is kind of a hard thing for a lot of individuals who are so, um, uh, you know, so much value the face-to-face -face experience to, uh, to believe in. But I'm talking about what the data have shown. So it actually brings up an interesting uh, question, and that is, you know, if you had uh, a class of 20, we usually have this idea that maybe, uh, uh, you know, 80% pass. And in fact, I don't want to get started on the, the normal curve, grading on the curve debate. In my field, it's all about mastery learning. Everyone should succeed is the argument. We, we are not comfortable at all with a, a, a normal curve distribution of, 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 of learning results. But let's say we had a class of 20 and we had 80% who, who passed, whatever that means. We would generally think that that's, that's a, a good, good rate. Now, what about for, for 2 million? What if I had a passing rate of 20%? Would we be happy with that? And your first inclination would be, no, that's not acceptable. But what does that mean, actually? That we actually had, uh, um, uh, uh, so 20% would be, what, 400,000? That, would that be the right? Yeah, 400,000. That's, that's an awesome number who have actually mastered this material, who have passed the course. Sometimes we, we might refer to this as a Sesame Street effect because there are a lot better ways of learning the alphabet than by watching Sesame Street. But the, the, the reach of Sesame Street to a young population is, is enormous. And it, the benefits of, of, of such a reach uh, are, are obvious. Now, uh, one, of my, uh, one, one of the people that I like to follow, and his, liter his scholarship is Donald Norman, a, a cognitive scientist. And he's written some really entertaining books, the, the psychology or the design of, of everyday things. It, the original title was the psychology of everyday things, but the publisher said that word psychology is bringing the sales down. Let's change it to design, so the design of everyday things. But when his most recent book is called Emotional Design. And there's a, there's a very provocative idea in there, which is up here on the screen, and that is uh, design that everybody likes but not loves is a good example of good design. But design that some people love and some people hate is a characteristic of great design design. And uh, uh, he talks a lot about that from the point of view of, of, of industrial engineering, that we have an emotional attachment to some things, even though, uh, again, uh, the functionality might be fine among products, but uh, certain products, and again, the Apple line of products tend to evoke this love-hate kind of relationship. So that brings up an interesting question, and one that I pose to my students in instructional design. What what learning curve are you really after? And uh, if you look at these uh, four examples, you have in each case just, just all hypothetical, of course. If you had 1,000 people in a sample and they all uh, were going to pass the, the tests or, or whatever the requirements were at, at whatever the level might be, it looked like about 80%, all four of these curves have an average of exactly the same number. Let's say it's 80%. But what we're looking at statistically isn't a measure of central tendency, it's variability. So even though the average is exactly the same, we have a very different spread of, of the scores. 
what would you be after if you were an instructional designer designing for materials for a group of people, let's say a thousand. But it also holds true with people who are teaching a class. And it's an interesting case because the first one, uh, A, says that most of the people get it, but you don't have any outliers. So on the good side of it is no one's really failing or very few, but very few are really into the content. They're just kind of passing and they're getting their passing grade and moving on. B, on the other hand, you're going to now have more of, an, of a case of a more typical kind of normal curve where you have uh, the majority get through. You might say the majority are happy to survive. Quite a few, though, uh, drop out, fail. We don't know really what happens to them. But then a few really get it, and, and they really thrive. And those are you know, the, the, your classic kind of A, B, C, D failing. C would be more the mastery example, where we have a, a skewed distribution, where the majority are, are getting it, uh, and the majority are going to succeed. But that D would be what Donald Norman's talking about. You have more of a bimodal distribution. You have a group of people who are just enthralled. They are absolutely passionate about this particular topic. They don't just get it. They are, they are flourishing. But at the expense, perhaps, of an equally large number of people, an equal number of people, who are disenfranchised. And in fact, uh, uh, Richard Feynman, in his uh, teaching of physics, really lamented the fact that uh, there was such a large group of people, despite his best um, um, attempts, were not getting the physics at the undergraduate level, despite his best attempts of teaching it. But so I don't know, I, I, I'm not saying there's a right answer. I can tell you what some of the literature talks about, like I say, with C being more with what instructional designers are after. But Donald Norman might be uh, suggesting that uh, D is what uh, great designers are after. I also believe that teaching is very idiosyncratic. Uh, coming from an, a, a, a field of, of instructional design, we have all kinds of rubrics and guides and recipes, quite frankly, for how to design instruction well. And um, uh, there's, a, there's, I think, also a myth that if you just follow some of those guidelines, and this is also going to be true for distance education, guidelines that you're going to come across, almost like the Bikichi kind of books as well that are going to be ha helping you to, to become a more successful teacher, um, I think you can also be a, a bit misled because I think a lot of the, the, the great teaching that I see really comes from the heart, really comes from a person who's passionate. And I think that is going to be informed in large part by who you are and what you bring to the table. And so I wonder how many of you are like me. So you've all had a nice big meal. You probably need a little bit of exercise. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And we're going to see who's left standing. And this is actually an interesting list. I tried to come up with a list of influences on me as an educator, as a teacher. And I tried to come up with this list in an order that also went from general to very specific. So I actually tried to see you know, what a lot of people would have in common, and then what gets more and more unique to Lloyd. Okay? And uh, so we're, we're going to play a little game here. If you don't mind standing up, you know, stretch a little bit, get a chance to work on that lunch. And uh, all I want you to do is, uh, if the, as we go down the list, if it does not apply to you, just to Take your seat again. Okay, so how many of you went to public school? Stay standing. Those of you who did not go to public school, please sit down. All right, you're with me. Good. We have a lot in common. How many of you have or had one, at least one child that attended a, that attends a K through 12 school? And certainly, my experience as a parent watching my children go through a public education system influenced me a great deal in my own teaching and what they were going through. I'm the first generation uh, in my immediate family who went to, college, went to college. I'm the fourth of five. And I think that's been a big deal for me. So in, in your immediate families, if you're the first, your generation, I should say, to go to college, uh, continue to stand. Otherwise, please have a seat. Ah. I didn't hear that, but no, no. Once you're, once you're out, you're out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way this game works. Thanks for playing. Um, for me, 
also, it was a very, very influential thing to also go. I went to a public school, but I also went to a Catholic school. So if you did not go to a Catholic school at some point in your life, please also have a seat. This is like Survivor, right? How many of you now that are standing are a former public school teacher? If you are, please keep, keep standing. One person. And do you have experience with homeschooling? Okay, well, I'm Lloyd. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so, you know, what I'm trying to get across here is my inf the influences on me are very distinct and very unique, and they are the same on you as well. And I think you bring all that to bear when you are in the classroom as well. Now, I don't know what your list would look like, and that's, an, like I say, a very interesting, interesting uh, 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 task is to come up with such a list with a group of people to see what, what, what the commonality is. The last thing I was going to say, I also play an accordion, so usually everyone sits down at that particular point. So when I became an online instructor for the first time, I was very humbled. And I was very much outside my comfort zone. And I realized what I was prepared for in teaching wasn't necessarily uh, um, coming to my, uh, to my side in those first few experiences. So I actually came to the to the conclusion. It took me five years as a public school teacher to become what I thought was a, a pretty good teacher. And I, you know, you have to take my word for it at that, that that was the case. But it didn't happen uh, very quickly. In fact, my first year of teaching, I kind of remember feeling very overwhelmed. Also, uh, and I, I wasn't really quite aware of, of the awesome responsibility, I will say very quickly, too. That didn't come till later. And I just remember kind of surviving and then then week to week, and then finally month to month until the year mercifully came to an end. And, and that, you know, and I often joke too that maybe the only people, the only one who got an education that year was me, and I only hope those children got an education somewhere else down the line. But it was, it was a great educational experience for me. But it took me about five years, so again, I'm a Star Trek fan, and thinking about the five-year mission and going and giving myself some room to maneuver. And I think that's one of my main messages to anyone who sees themselves as a, as a master teacher or a really good teacher in, in a face-to-face -face experience, going into an online environment, to say to yourself, you are better advised to think of yourself as a first-year teacher because it, gave, it gives you an opportunity to explore, an opportunity to make some mistakes. It also gives you an opportunity to recognize some of your peers as mentors. And that can be really difficult for a lot of, a lot of instructors who want to, you know, they, once, you, once you have that identity as a, as a successful instructor, it's hard to give that up that now I'm not the, you know, one of the, one of the tops in this, in this particular area. So using the Star Trek metaphor a little bit further here, I uh, uh, really began to soak, the, I, you could say I was a sponge, but uh, much more of a Borg, a friendly Borg though, you know. Uh, so I tried to assimilate lots of online teaching strategies and tools. So I just have all kinds of things here that come up. Uh, my UGA colleagues uh, were, were very influential. I like to give Mike Ory, Jeanette Hill, and Julie Tom a lot of credit. But these are just some of the things that I began to explore. And some of it I also taught for Nova Southeastern. I taught for Governors, uh, West, Western Governors University. I, I taught for a private company called Best Practice Network. And I really said to myself, what, what are they doing? And how they, do they go about it? So when I taught for Nova Southeastern, I took on a curriculum that they had in an approach. And rather than saying, you know, I know how to teach instructional design, I'm not going to use what they've given me. I said, you know, let me see how they've done it. And let me just explore that for the, for the time. I didn't have a, cha a choice, really. That was part of the contractual arrangement. But I had a good attitude about it. And it gave me a sense of what worked and what didn't work from their, uh, from their design. The other thing I learned, and uh, comes, and I'll use the Wright brothers as my, as my segue to this, is uh, something about uh, those around me who I really could trust. And uh, I love the story of the Wright brothers. It's just, there's just something about it that these two brothers you know, from Dayton uh, were able to, uh, to conquer uh, controlled flight when uh, they, they did not have a formal education. In fact, in many ways, they discovered the formal uh, aerodynamic principles on their own those who did have an education in uh, aerodynamics or the, the emerging field, in many ways, were at a disadvantage. A lot of the misconceptions that were out there were, were uh, I think, actually a distraction to them. 
So they were, they were engineers, <clears throat> I think most people agree. I would say they were scientists as well. If you look at their uh, experiments in the wind tunnel and get data collection, and having the data show them the way. But they were also something else that's usually overlooked, something very, very important. They were the world's most experienced pilots. Now, we th you, might, you might even chuckle at that, saying that, well, you know, they, they, that doesn't make any sense. Well, they, it, they had enormous seat time, almost killing themselves, actually, given how, how uh, tough it was to control. And they used those three things, the engineering, the scientific method, and their own experience in the seat to understand what is working and what is not. And I, I don't, don't, don't know how else to say it. I actually say beware of colleagues who are the, of the first and the second kind, but not the, sec, but not the third. There's a lot of folks out there, for example, writing about distance education who, frankly, I know. And I know for a fact they've never taught online. So and again, I'm always open to good ideas, wherever they may come from. But when it comes to mentors, I would definitely argue that you should find those who have the seat time, have something to, to actually, to actually uh, tell you. And, and, and think of them as mentors and respect them for that. You may ultimately disagree. You may ultimately say, that doesn't work for me. But that attitude of, I'm going to look at you as a mentor is, I think, very important. So in, uh, in, in, in my little talks like this, there's, there's so many guides out there for uh, what it means to be a successful online instructor. And I mean, there lots of guidance, lots of, again, manuals, lots of books. You can read a, a great deal about this, and I encourage you to do so. But I tried to distill for me the three most essential principles for being a successful online teacher, leading, of course, to successful learning. And that's what I'd like to share with you uh, right now. And also then I'm going to kind of end with some of the things that I actually have been doing in my own online teaching, which I think, again, very idiosyncratic for me, the things I'm very proud of. And maybe it'll give you some ideas about how you might do something uh, also based on your, your dis predispositions or dispositions for teaching and learning. One of them is <laughs> what's good for learning is good for online turning good for online learning too. What, what this means is everything we know about uh, uh, learning and cognition and motivation and uh, uh, from cognitive psychology and your own experiences in the face-to-face -face, uh, arena as well, you, you can bring that to bear. And again, there's a lot of just fundamental ideas about, again, learning and cognition that work. We, we tend to have, I think, a bit of a myth that online learning is somehow a different kind of learning. It's the same kind of learning um, it may have more challenges. I may have to be more, more creative in how I'm going to be using that, that environment. But uh, good ideas are, for learning are good ideas. What's good for learning is good for learning. And in fact, most of the things I have developed for my online teaching, I also use in my face-to-face. -face. I may use the resources that are web-based. I may be doing things in an asynchronous manner, even though I'm, I'm going to be bringing the students together face-to-face. -to -face, but the ideas and the strategies work equally well. And in my own case, based on some of my own research uh, efforts, uh, I'm, I'm, if I were, were to distill down some of the things that I'm all about, uh, one is the fact that you need to have experience first on which to, to understand the explanations that come. This is, I think, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make. They give explanations to something when the learner has no experience on which to understand that explanation. So that's one. Uh, and also, I study things like in, in, uh, uh, instruction. When is it, when is it uh, not necessary? Or conversely, when is it most needed? And there's lots of examples in education where you can have outstanding learning taking place where the environment that was set up by the instructor was not one based primarily on a direct instruction method. I uh, should say, to thine own online teaching self be true. And what that means is, when I first started learning about online um, education, uh, and again, this goes back about 2001. Uh, WebCT, of course, was uh, uh, the learning management system. Uh, at UGA was one of the first adopters, by the way, of, of WebCT, one of the, the, the early adopters. Um, frankly, the, the systems, and I would even make this criticism now, leave a lot to be desired. And the one um, a tool that seemed to be used primarily, uh, almost sometimes exclusively, uh, were discussion boards. And you know what? I don't like discussion boards. 
either as a student or as, a, as an instructor. And the, I think the point I'm trying to make is if I'm not enthusiastic about the approach, I can't fake that. I have to believe in it. Now, there, I've been using discussion boards on occasion where they make a lot of sense. But I have to really be able to see in my own mind why that particular uh, use of that tool is, is needed. Now, that isn't to say that discussion boards should not be used. In fact, I like to tell the little story. There, we, had a, uh, we hired a, uh, an adjunct to teach one of our research methods courses for master's students. And I had already developed a research method, methods course for online education my way. You know? And I thought this was pretty good. And I thought for sure he was going to take it and use it. And he looked at it and he said, well, that is pretty good. But I think I'm going to still do it my way. And it's you know, academic freedom. That's fine. And it was heavily based on discussion boards. And I said, oh, I know what's going to happen. This is going to be a, this is going to be a problem. It turned out, as I talked to students afterwards, they really enjoyed the course. They got a lot out of it. So I, I can't tell you exactly what he did precisely with the discussion forums, but he was creative. He was able to use that tool very effectively, and I, I respect that. It doesn't work for me. So my point is, I'm not going to use a tool simply because it seems to be the tool that people are all, all using. I'm, going to, I'm not going to mimic what seems to be online education. And as the learning management systems in particular begin to get more creative, there are some really exciting developments going on right now in that, in that world. Um, I think the opportunities for doing things beyond simply a very narrow range uh, are, are really growing. I would actually say some of the, the early learning management systems, uh, again, it's, it's, it's only been about 10 years ago, constrained instructors in such a way that they were so limited in terms of what the experience was going to be. So uh, I, do, I do a lot of work with gaming and simulations. And this is, if you like Stephen Wright, you'll like this joke, very deadpan, you know. I've designed the perfect business training simulation. Unfortunately, it takes 30 years to play, meaning go into business, see how it goes. You know. So I am also all about trying to make sure that we have efficient, effective instruction, that we learn some things, not simply through the school of hard knocks. I actually have something to, to, uh, to, to, to offer. So let me give you an example of something that I've done that uh, I think is a good story. I've actually written about this separately. Uh, one of the courses I teach is called Instructional Design. And um, it's a very important course. It's our bread and butter course in the instructional technology field, I would, I would argue. And of the things that are in that course, one of the most important um, uh, set of ideas or principles is something called task analysis. I'm not here to teach you task analysis. But, but it's important. That's the main thing. The other, the other thing is I don't like teaching task analysis. I find it boring. And like I said, I can't fake things. And so students generally would report that the thing they, they liked least about the course was the section on task analysis. Well, I finally confronted this and trying to bring some of my talents and some of the, the tools and so forth to, to bear on this. And so I came up with a game called In Search of Lost Wisdom to try to tackle what I think is a very important topic, but to, to, to make it be something that is going to be more effective than the way I was teaching it. And uh, I'll give you the, the short version of this. I, I set a story context. It's year 4029, and you're an archaeologist. And, and your team has discovered uh, a, a room on your latest dig that has apparently scrolls all through the room containing, apparently, examples of, of wisdom back, way back when, at the year 2011 time that we have very little in recorded history about. So you see what I'm doing, trying to set the stage, setting a good, a good story. Now, with this, with this game, uh, I tell them some of the, all these, these scrolls seem to have, uh, they're written in English, but it's a, an older form of English, and we can't quite make it out. Some of the words are, 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 are we, we can see, but some of them are just, we're just kind of clueless. We need this, we, we could use a Rosetta Stone, hence the, hence the graphic. So, for example, now you might guess this pretty quickly. So if you're reading one of these lost scrolls, and it says, okay, it's, it's some lost wisdom. So what does it say to do? It says, grab one buckle in each hand. Pull the buckles tight with the vertical pull. Cross the buckles. Pull the front buckle around the back of the other. Pull that buckle through the liger. Tighten the buckle with a horizontal pull. Make a charm. Tighten the charm. Now, as you look at it, you say, ooh, that's weird. But does it sound vaguely familiar? Like something maybe you already know how to do? 
Yeah, so there's apparently a mis there's some communication problems here. So what I think of as lace, they call it a buckle. What, they, what I think of as a bow, they call it a charm. So it's disguising it a little bit. So in this little game, what, what we had, again, students were all around Georgia, and I'll use Tom Cruise, one of my more famous students. Uh, Tom wrote uh, a bit, he had to take on the persona first as a writer of lost wisdom. And so he had to pick up some example of everyday wisdom and, know, and knew that uh, everyone in the class was going to try and guess what it was. So he couldn't just say how to tie a shoe. You have to, you have to be a little more creative than that, Tom, and uh, try to, to disguise what it's going to be. But you have to give us the code also, the Rosetta Stone. So my role in this is simply to look at Tom's example of task analysis, everyday wisdom, and just kind of check, was it a valid example or not? If it wasn't, I'd say, you know, you're not ready to play the game, keep working on it. Most of the time, they get it. So I would send that back with feedback saying, okay, you did, 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 did okay. The moment I did that, it opened up Tom to the game in the sense that his example was now going to be shared with everybody else in the course. And then Tom also had access to their examples. And what happened over the next three or four days, and I, I did develop this system using some programming knowledge that I have, uh, they just began to explore the, the lost wisdom. And the way it works, you, you would take two guesses. The first would be like you did, like, I think that might be tie your shoes. So you would enter tie your shoes, but maybe you thought it was something about fishing, and you put that in the first time. Then you get the code, you did have a second guess. And hopefully by then, you would know exactly what it is. But if you didn't, that means they didn't do a very good job with their, with their coding system. And so we had then winners. How good were you at guessing the examples. So we had a winning category of archaeologists. And also, uh, who had the most, you know, not, not the most difficulty, but it wasn't too hard, it wasn't too easy in understanding your example of lost wisdom. Turns out, I love this topic now. I look forward to it. I, the game teaches the content. I use my time to use the examples that they are coming up with to debrief what makes for a good task analysis. The examples go into it, the winning examples go into a database that continually gets bigger and bigger. So by the end of the course, it's my favorite topic and it's the student's favorite topic. And that's a message that, again, you know, to my own self be true. Finally, um, prepare a well-organized and easy to follow course learning plan for students. And this is a tough one for a lot of, of, of college instructors because what this means is you are going to use a systematic plan for designing your instruction. It also means, because uh, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of the college instructors who they have a syllabus. It maybe is a page, and they go week after week, and they're kind of winging it. Then they may have taught this over a period of time, but it's not a, a systematically designed experience. Now, I would also argue we want that, you know, maybe 20% creativity to always come to bear or, or come to the, to the to, 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 be, to be brought to bear. But in online education, you have to get organized. And so my, my final recommendation is that you have a well-organized course learning plan. And frankly, um, I wasn't happy with WebCT at all. I designed my own humble learning management system. I think what you could do now in the learning management systems can, 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 can reflect what I, what I try to do here. But basically, I had one long, it's a to-do list. Um, but it was organized according to the different categories you can see there with uh, with uh, readings and video and different presentations and activities, projects, Q&A, different forms. And this one page probably had 80 to 90 links on it, but it was the entire course of what uh, you would experience. And I would, would have to orient people to what this actually, actually meant. So it makes you get organized. And it makes you think about the entire course structure before the first day of class. And that, I think, is extremely important. Uh, I'm about ready to end this little talk. I know we've got the presentation starting uh, uh, pretty soon at, at 1 o'clock. But uh, there's some interesting things that I'll, I'll kind of end on. Uh, I, I'm a, I subscribe to uh, the Prof Hacker blog on, uh, on the Chronicle. And uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, New York uh, NYU professor uh, vows never to probe cheating again uh, and faces a backlash. Uh, basically, he took cheating seriously and felt that he paid a price for it. Uh, in terms of, of his teacher evaluations and uh, his reward system and so on. And, and one of the conclusions that he drew was, you know, 
why put students in a position where they're, they're tempted to cheat? And that would be my message. There are plenty of ways, especially with project-based uh, uh, approaches to instruction, where it, it, it's easier actually to do the work than to than do the cheating. Uh, another one, and I'm a, I'm a true uh, uh, die-in-the-wool constructivist, uh, meaning that I, I really believe a lot in, in, in experiences for the students, and, and I, I tend to downplay direct instruction, but I think I've gone too far, is the, is the thought I've been having. I, I have not been given quizzes uh, in my, in my uh, ex, uh, higher ed experience. I, th I, I want them to use that content that they're reading and apply it. That's, that's the message. But I, I have discovered over the last few years, I don't think students read very well. So I began, I've begun to, to, to bring in quizzes back into my classroom. But uh, you ever play Trivial Pursuit? It's, it's a lot of fun with the family and all. And it, it, it does in, invoke the play phenomena, meaning you really feel like you're at play. But it's all facts, right? That's, and it's, it's kind of fun to know things. But usually we think of facts as being so low level and not worth you know, in, um, committing to memory. But it's fun to know. It's rewarding to know. So I've actually uh, uh, come up with a system. Not, this is my, my current research project where um, I give students a very uh, long quiz or test, really, that they have to master. They have to get 100% correct. None of this 80%. Every single question they have to get correct. Now, the thing is, they can take it as often as they want. And in some regards, I'm also looking at ways that I can set up opportunities for students to talk together where they think they might even be cheating, but I th I'm encouraging it. But the mastery level means you might take this test 10, 15, 20 times. And you know, you can just do a trial and error if you want to. Turns out, it's easier to take if you read the book. <laughs> It'll actually be an easier experience and more rewarding. So I'm trying to find ways to set up the experience where it's, it's, it's actually easier not to cheat. Finally, um, I am the Director of Innovation in Technology and uh, Teaching and Technology in the College of Education, a title that I gave myself, by the way. Uh, but the Dean gave me an opportunity to take on a new role, and this is the role I took. And uh, by the way, that young man happens to be my son-in-law, that's Kelly Laborde, about to jump off uh, the one bridge, I forget the name of it, in Idaho. Very it's legal on certain days to, to jump off this very, uh, he's a base jumper, they, that's, that is a parachute, and the person taking the photograph is my daughter. So I have a lot invested in this, in this photograph. But I've been using this photograph as a uh, symbol or a metaphor for innovation and teaching and technology, kind of going back to teaching. The thrill, the excitement, the terror. The exhilaration that you get from doing it well, as well as being Again, somewhat terrorized at times. And that's, that's what, what Kelly kind of brings out. If you look at Kelly, though, you get a sense that he's determined. You get a sense that he's terrified. No, he, he looks like he's ready. He's, he's, he's ready for the, the activity. He knows what he's doing. I, I'm sure he's scared, but in, in a sense, just like going into a classroom, if, I, if I'm well prepared, that, that little bit of, of fear I know is going to be replaced with the exhilaration. So we've been doing some things like creating also our own little television. We have something I created called Innovation 2020. Uh, and it's a 20 minute presentation by our by faculty recognized as being innovative in their teaching. So a nice, short, bite-sized piece of what they're doing. The other 20 is a chance to actually discuss it with them if you, if you actually come to their presentation. We record the first 20. And I did the first on my use of uh, uh, In Search of Lost Wisdom. So if you want, I can. On the, on the YouTube channel there, a few other of our faculty. And I do use the bridge as a, one of my metaphors. This is actually the, uh, um, the bridge in West Virginia, the New River Gorge Bridge, which my son-in-law has also jumped off of, I will tell you. Um, wonderful bridge, but I just love it because it's math and science, you know, engineering. It's also beautiful. It's just absolutely uh, beautiful. So this idea of taking steps from the known to the unknown, sometimes, you know, crossing that chasm and finding what is going to be your bridge. But I tell my faculty, sometimes it's a bridge that looks like that, but it really might be this. So if you fall off, you might get your feet wet. It might be, you know, a little, little, little scuff. So you may think of it as being a huge uh, uh, bridge to cross in order to be innovative in your teaching, but it might not be so bad. I always like to give the final message. It's not the distance traveled that matters. It's the direction you are going. So many times people worry that they haven't gone far enough fast enough. 
And you, know, you want to make sure, most importantly, that you're heading in the right direction. I'll end with the photograph that I started with, me student teaching back in 1979. And uh, I've really looked at this photograph a lot over, over uh, the last few years as I've been certainly giving talks like this. And you know, the one student, uh, well, if you look at, look at the students for a second, you can see the one little boy with his hand up. You know, he's, he's so excited. And, and well, just about everybody is, is you know, in the moment with me. Um, except this little girl here. Now, she was probably just seeing the camera and whatever. She was distracted. But I guess my point is I was not connecting with her. And again, as, as, a, as a teacher who really loves teaching, that bothers me that I wasn't connecting to that, one, to that one child. And so that's what I hope I always do is connect to everyone. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference.